Okay, well, thank you, Leanne, and thank you to all of you for uh, being here for this uh, conference tonight. It's nice to have this time together. Well, paying attention to who we are is important at all times, but it is really extremely critical in times of change, loss, and stress. And you, dear ladies, are going through a monumental life change of losing your spouse. Now, I want to ask you kind of a different question, but I just want you to think about this. If I were going to ask you right now, if you were a kitchen utensil, what kitchen utensil would you be? And think about that. Maybe write it down. Maybe even talk to somebody about it at some point. And now I want you to think about if you were going, if I was going to ask you to think about what kitchen utensil you were prior to your husband's death, your life change, the stress that you have been through, what utensil would you be and why? Now, let me explain this a bit. I have not experienced what you are experiencing. My husband is still living. We've been married 43 years, but three years ago, my husband was diagnosed with head and neck cancer. He, it's a risk for smokers, heavy alcohol use. He's neither of those, but he has head and neck cancer. And he has had five major surgeries, a tracheotomy at one point, two rounds of chemo. He's had the maximum amount of radiation and he has trouble swallowing with his taste buds and overall strength. And he continues a three week regimen of immunotherapy to hold this very aggressive form of cancer at bay. Before this diagnosis, I would have said I was a wire whisk. I was stirring everything up and rushing around, doing and taking care of lots of things. It was Rob's business, my business, church, family, travel, fun, just whisking together everything in my life, making sure that nothing stuck too long to any container. Now today I would say I am a rubber spatula, clearly and very intentionally, calmly, carefully, stirring in and scraping the edges of the bowl to get every drop out of every day, each moment and intentionally adding into our lives what we can, folding it in gently. My circumstances have changed. My purpose has had to change, and my utensil has changed. Over the years, the various roles that I have had and the responsibilities that have been part of my various roles has led to a tremendous interest and frankly, a very real need for me to be consciously aware of who I am and how I show up. I personally have experienced sudden loss, or big changes to what my expectations were for life. And in my coaching business, I work with people who have had a sudden job loss or a personal change. And as I am sure many of you could attest to, that kind of thing throws us all a little off kilter. We have trouble focusing on who we are and we may be at a loss to identify what we have to offer an employer, what we have to offer our families, and actually, what do we even have to offer ourselves? We may lack that sense of purpose and direction. It is in times of these, in these situations, that I have found the need for doing a very deep dive into self-awareness can be extremely helpful. That is what I want to talk to you about tonight. And so to illustrate this, let me share a story with you. And it's a Bible story from 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7. Now, some of you maybe will recall this Bible story from your Sunday school, or maybe it's the first time you've ever heard this story. But I want you to listen to it carefully with a little paraphrasing on my part. There is a woman, a widow, who is in desperate need of help. She is in a place of great sadness. Her husband, a man of God, known to Elisha, the prophet of God, has died. And she is grieving. And then not only that, 
but now creditors have showed up at her door and they are telling her if she does not get caught up on all of her past due bills, that they are going to take her two sons and they are going to take her sons and make them indentured servants. This means at least seven years of service. She has lost her husband. She is facing the very real reality of losing her boys. She has gone through everything in the house and has taken everything she can think of to the open market, to the village to sell. Her furniture, pottery jars, clothes the boys have outgrown, her husband's possessions that he had. She has probably laid awake at night and thought of who could she ask for help? And she has run down the list of those people and for some reason or another, she has dismissed them that she can't go to them and ask for any help. But then all of a sudden she remembers Elisha and she probably sat straight up in bed and said to herself, yes, that is it. Finally, I have a step I can take. Finally, I have a plan that I can move forward on. I will go to Elisha. He will remember my husband. So she goes to Elisha and she explains who she is and she explains her dire situation. And the Bible says, Elisha, after hearing all of this, he replies to her and he says, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Well, it doesn't take her long to answer him because she's just gone through her whole house and she's gotten rid of stuff, sold stuff, everything she can think of. And so she replies, your servant has nothing at all. I imagine there was a pause. And I imagine that Elisha was waiting and he was thinking to himself, really? Nothing at all? And finally, after a little bit of thought, she says, except a small jar of olive oil. Then upon hearing this, Elisha says, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour oil into all the jars. And as each is filled, set it to the side. She left him. Her sons brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. And when all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another jar. And he replied, there is not a jar left. And then the oil stopped flowing. She went and told the man of God, and he said, go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on what is left. Isn't it interesting that so often when someone asks us what we have, our first response is nothing, or I can't. I don't have the time, or I don't have the money, or the right attitude, or the right experiences, or the education I need, or the energy, or the connections that are necessary. But do you? Do you actually know what you have? Just like the woman in 2 Kings, for our own lives today, as we reflect on that same question that Elisha asked the widow, I want you to think about that. What do you have? To become self-aware of who you are and what you have and where you are at, we're gonna take an inventory of your life. I really want you to think about viewing your life, seeing it, identifying different things in your life, what is actually in there. And I would strongly encourage you to get a journal and write it down. So you say, what, what, what should we inventory? Well, there's lots of things and we don't have time to cover them all tonight, but I'm going to cover a few things that I think will be helpful for you to begin to inventory. First of all, like the widow, inventory your stuff, your possessions, your property, household items, books, computer equipment, toys, fabric, clothes. I mean, whatever it is, just an inventory of everything you have. 
Now, what this may do for you is to really spur you on to clean things, to throw things out, to sell things, to simplify, to refresh, to go with a whole new look. And it can be very invigorating, this cleansing experience. It can give you a sense of freedom and not being bogged down by your past just by going through your possessions. So I would encourage you to do that. Years ago, James Dobson, in a Focus on the Family film, I remember him saying this and I've never forgotten it. He said, we need to stop and identify, do we own our possessions or do our possessions own us? Next, inventory your strengths, your skills, your passions, your personality, and your values. Now, we aren't going to have time to cover all of that in detail, but I am going to be teaching a class for Wings for Widow in the fall, and we will have more time to do a deeper dive into these things. But just let me quickly mention these. Strengths. Strengths are the things that you are naturally gifted in, that you look forward to using, that when you use these natural strengths and abilities, you are just energized by them. So think about what are those things for you? What are your strengths? Secondly, the skills. What are the things that you have learned to do really well, but it sometimes is difficult for you. You don't look forward to it. It makes you tired. You would rather not do it, but you've had to learn how to do it. Now, for me, that's things that have to do with numbers. So I'm not a finance guy and I really would prefer not to do budgets and not to do invoicing and not to set pricing, but I've had to learn how to do all these things in my, for my business. And can I do them? Yes, I can do them well, but it really is quite exhausting for me and I would prefer not to do them. But I did just get my taxes done for the quarterly Minnesota sales tax uh, last night. So that would be skills. Inventory your passions. What are you really enthusiastic about? The things that really matter to you. That, that when you're doing them, time just flies. And you feel like this is something that is one of the most worthwhile ways that you can spend your time. What would that be? Something that makes you feel that it makes a really, a, just a difference to someone or to an organization or to um, a, a company. So a passion, values. What compels you to take a stand? Now, when I work with clients, I have a value card sort and they have multiple, multiple cards that they have to go through and they have to get down to eight values that are important to them, that they would use those eight values to make a decision. Now, I know you don't have that value card, card sword, but there are two things that you can easily do to get an idea of what you value. And the first one is your time. Look at your calendar. How do you spend your time? What do you carve out time for? That will tell you what is important to you, what you value. The second thing that you can do is look at how you spend your money. So looking at your credit card statement, or if, if you still use a checkbook, looking at what you write checks for, you will be able to see, this is what is valuable to me because I am willing to spend money on it. So what is it that you value? Inventory that. Next, inventory your jobs and your experiences. Write down every single job you have ever had and briefly what you did. And then with each one of those jobs, think about what did you like, what did you not like, and maybe one or two things that you learned from that job. I've done this. This is so interesting. I, my first job was when I was in fourth grade. My sister and I cleaned houses. Now I know child labor laws and all that, but we cleaned houses starting when I was in fourth grade and she was in fifth grade. Start to write these down. And when you see all of these jobs laid out collectively, you will start probably to see a theme, a pattern to them that will become a common denominator that will give you indications of what you truly love to do and maybe what is not something that you would prefer to do. But it gives you that perspective. 
inventory your education, your classes, your certifications. Yes, that's a very important part of what you have accomplished. And there may be a correlation to the direction that you have taken in your life or in your career, but there may not be. You may see a, a very different path that you have taken from your education as well. It doesn't matter for some people that is that would be a PhD. For other people, it's a community ed class on cake decorating. Whatever those education certifications classes, it is very important to inventory them so that you can start to see those things that you have really accomplished in your life. And it may help you find direction for a career or even a hobby. Next, inventory your emotions. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this because Julie Hall in her presentation talked about this and also Betsy Anderson. I would encourage you if you haven't watched those, go back and look at them. They are excellent. But really, what makes you sad, glad, mad, angry, worried? What are those things? What are you afraid of? What do you fear? What brings you joy? What, what totally overwhelms you? What makes you laugh? What makes you um, just, well, what gives you a sense of renewed hope and peace and confidence? It's, it's really helpful to do that. I, I actually learned when I was just talking recently to Betsy Anderson about even putting names to loss. And that has really helped me in, in the situation that I'm in now with my husband and his health issues. What are those emotions that you have? Name them and put them down. Next, inventory your speech. Now, I'm not talking or thinking so much about what you say to other people. What I want you to inventory here is, is what do you say to yourself? What are the messages, the self-talk that you tell yourself? And, you know, so many times we tell ourselves um, just messages of condemnation rather than affirmation. It's, we, we just say things like, you know, I can never, I won't, I always, I'm so stupid. What did I do that for? The other night I browned a whole bunch of hamburger. I totally forgot, left it on the counter never put it away in the refrigerator or freezer. I had to throw the whole thing out. I was sending messages to myself, like how, Susie, really, that was the stupidest thing to do. Why did you do that? That is so stupid. But we send ourselves these messages, inventory those, what are you telling yourself? And it is so, it is so contrary to what God's view of us is. God sees us as his masterpiece. We are a masterpiece to God. We are created in God's image and he loves us and values us. We need to have that same appreciation and realize that God loves us. He created us. We are his masterpiece and have affirmation. Now you can get affirmations from quotes, from different things. I would, there are so many affirmations in scripture that I would highly recommend, and maybe, and I've got a, a list of affirmations from the Bible, and I'm going to try to send that as a resource to Leanne, so maybe she can post it. But send yourself messages that are positive and encouraging and not the other way. Inventory your dreams. Now, not so much what you dream at night, although some people say you should inventory those, but I'm, I'm talking about do you have dreams? Do you have things that you want to accomplish? Do you have places that you want to go? Is there something that you really want to experience? One time in my life when I was particularly sad and lonely, I realized that for some reason I had stopped dreaming. I was in the present and I really wasn't treasuring the moments in that time or space but I also had stopped dreaming about my life going forward. And even now with Rob being sick, our dreams for the future have changed some, but we still have dreams. One time I was talking to Leanne and I said, Leanne, you know, you gotta get something out there on the calendar, something that you're looking forward to, put something down and have something to look forward to. In fact, 
dreams and hopes and desires change. And when the people in our life change and we have to let go of some of those old dreams that we had with them. And I, I know that, that that just has to be so hard. I can't even imagine that, that that's what you're doing. But you need to dream new dreams, dreams that are your own. So inventory your dreams. Inventory your support. Who are those people that you can count on to sit with you, to listen to you, to pray with you and for you, to be there, that you know you truly can just be yourself. It doesn't matter about the makeup, the outfit, a polished presentation. There's no hidden agendas that you can just call, that they will talk or they will be silent, but they will be there for you. Keep track of who those people are. You're gonna need them. And I'm sure you found that out already. And maybe you will identify by doing this at well, that there are some people that you should not call, or at least you're better off not having in, their li in your life as much or as often, that maybe you need to take a break from some people um, and inventory that so that you can have those people to call. So those are just a few things to inventory. There's lots of things. So write it all down. This full inventory then becomes a full perspective. It's the lens through which you look to recognize who you are and that equips you really to navigate and cope and confront the change, the situation, and this loss that, that we are in. Now, this knowledge is powerful because what it does it serves to prepare and equip you to respond to change rather than to react to change as you are ready in yourself for this next chapter of life. Viktor Frankl in Man's Search for Meaning in his book said this, somewhere between stimulus and response, there is a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Critically doing an honest, intentional inventory in that space will give you the self-awareness, the data, the knowledge that will give you power to choose your response. It will move you from a mindset of scarcity. I don't have anything at all to a mindset of abundance. You will be able to look at all that God has provided for you and that he has equipped you with. The widow had one jar of precious olive oil and it was the best thing she had left. And instead of holding onto it and saving it for fear that it was the only thing that she had left, she was obedient and she did exactly as Elisha instructed her to do. She poured it out and the oil just kept flowing and flowing jar after jar after jar because that is the way God is. God is a God of abundance, not of scarcity. He is faithful to provide all that we need and more. There's an old chorus that as a little girl growing up in, on an Iowa farm spoke to me as to the, the resources of God. And it helped me picture this amazing and abundant God. And the words go like this. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. He owns the rivers and the rocks and the rills and the sun and the stars that shine. Wonderful riches, more than tongue can tell. He is my father, so they're mine as well. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, I know that he will care for me. This helps me put into perspective who I am, who you are. You are a child of God. God is your father. One time when Princess Diana of Wales, British royalty was in the news, of course, several years ago, my then 85-year-old aunt said to my sister, Sally, Sally, 
can you imagine what it would be like to be royalty? And Sally said, well, yes, I can, because we are royalty. We are the daughters of the king of kings. My aunt was touched by that and told my sister that she had never thought of that before. Do you know that you are royalty? Do you know that you are a child of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Your father, God, has unlimited resources, unlimited abundance, and he isn't withholding it from you. It is your inheritance here and now. He wants you to know what you have and use it for his glory and his purpose. Knowing who you are, self-awareness, and knowing God is a God of abundance and not scarcity, you can then take action with purpose and courage and confidence. Now, one of the ways that you can take action very intentionally and purposely and move tiny steps into another chapter to find renewed sense of purpose and meaning is by using start, stop, continue. This is a way that I encourage my clients to start taking and making um, progress in their goals. And this is something that, yes, I would encourage you to do. And it goes like this, start, I am going to start fill in the blank. I'm going to start asking for help. I'm going to start doing these inventories. I'm going to start breathing deeply. I'm going to start stretching. When Rob got sick, one of my starts was to begin each morning with prayer. And this came to me when I read Psalm 5.3. It has kind of become my theme verse for the last three years, this chapter of life that I'm in. And it says this, each morning I bring my request to you and wait expectantly. Bringing requests to the Lord and just waiting expectantly, that was my start. And then stop. I am going to stop, fill in the blank. I'm going to stop telling myself that I have no strengths. I'm going to stop telling myself that I can't figure out my finances. I'm going to stop telling myself that I have to do everything myself. I'm going to stop the negative self-talk and then continue. I'm going to continue doing this. Look at your life. What are those things that you're doing that you need to be very purposeful and intentional because you know that they serve you and they serve you well and you shouldn't let them slide off somewhere and not continue doing them. So fill in those blanks. That will be helpful for you. I have really enjoyed my time. I want to encourage you, get a journal, write, inventory those things that we've talked about and other things that come to your heart and to your mind. Do the stop, start, continue. That will be helpful for you. And then hopefully we'll have more time uh, later on in the fall to go over some of those strengths, skills, values, personality, and passions at some point in the future. Thank you so much. It's been great to be with you ladies tonight. Love you, dear. Love you, too. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce Jeff. Jeff is our uh, wonderful coach. He's one of our financial coaches at Wings for Widows. And uh, he has a great topic. Um, it may not apply to all of you, but I think he's got some tips that will apply to anyone who's working with an on let's say, uncooperative family situation. But he's got some good tips, um, uh, more on the financial side, but also on relational side. So I'm gonna give Jeff um, this time, and then at the end, I wanna close and, and introduce our next Zoom call, which will be on the 29th. So Jeff, take it away. All right, thank you, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, well, before I actually launch into my little talk, I thought I'd tell you guys a quick story. Um, I know many of you are from here in Minnesota. If you're not, you uh, should know that we have some characters that we talk about a lot here um, named Sven, Oli, and Lena. Um, and so in this particular uh, story, Oli died. And so Oli's wife, Lena, goes 
well, I suppose I should probably go put an obituary in the newspaper. So she walks down to the newspaper office and Sven is working there and he sees her come in and says, oh, Lena, I'm so sorry to hear about Oli. And he goes, he goes, yeah, yeah, uh, I figured I should come down and, and put the obituary in. And Sven says, yeah, that's probably a good idea. So he puts the, the form for submitting something into the paper in front of her and and she looks at it and she writes down Oli died and Lena uh, is sets it back in front of Sven and Sven looks at it thinks about it a second he goes you know I think maybe you should uh, put a little more detail into that Lena and she goes no that about sums it up and uh, so Sven's a little uncomfortable with that. And she, he says, you know, there's a lot more space that you get um, for paying for this. So, you know, I really think that you should use what, what you get and, and put a little more detail in it. So Lena thinks hard on it and she thinks, okay, how about this? Oldie died, vote for sale. <laughs> so. That was a joke that I heard at my uncle's funeral, um, my, uh, which was about 10 years ago. Um, my uncle is an avid fisherman and I had so many wonderful memories of fishing with my uncle. And many, many people at his funeral knew him as a fisherman. Many had spent time fishing with him. And um, it was a little bit, um, unusual, I think, for me to hear uh, a joke like that at a funeral, but it was such a wonderful tribute um, to my uncle's sense of humor. Um, so I really enjoyed that. Um, and with uh, Susie talking about um, getting rid of things, I, I thought, well, we got to talk about getting rid of the boat. So um, at any rate, my talk tonight, um, I'm calling Blended Families and Estate Debates. Um, as Leanne said, I think this does apply um, to any kind of family that has um, some conflict in it around the states. There's a lot of this that I think will apply to that. Um, but a, a, a handful of things that I think are kind of unique with the blended family situation. Um, a little background on me. As um, Leanne said, um, I was a, a professional therapist for many years. Um, I also did family court mediations um, before uh, I, my career moved me from those into being a financial planner. And um, when it comes to things like this, I find that the strange uh, weaving of my career has unintentionally created a unique skill set um, that as a financial planner, I've really um, found that working with people who got emotional situations around their finances. Um, yeah, I'm really glad to have, be able to bring that all together. Um, I am in a blended, blended family myself, um, complete with three biological children of mine, um, a one stepchild, and if that's not enough, three dogs. Um, so, We've got a full house and um, I have a good understanding for any of you that might be a part of a blended family of the, um, the interesting nuances that that creates. Um, so getting into blended families and estates, um, I'd like to talk about facing the blood relatives without drawing blood. Um, I think that can be a challenge at times too. Um, for those of you who are part of the blended family, you know that conflicts with the steps in your life is nothing new. Um, in some cases, you've had a chance to become close with them over the years. Um, and in others, we have a hard time even breaking the ice. Um, but I think when we lose that person who has been the glue between us and them, um, that can really complicate that situation. 
Um, what I am not going to get into today, I'm actually going to probably spend a lot more time talking about the relational side of it when it comes to looking at the assets um, than going into the assets themselves. Um, I don't really want to get into what the law says about the rights of anybody to estates, whether they're a child or a spouse. Um, that's a good conversation to have with an attorney. Um, and uh, I don't really want to talk about how to split assets um, or talking about probates or wills. Um, rather, I want to encourage people to think about um, the, the people that are involved in this as it starts to get into uh, a stuff conversation um, or a money conversation are still people that shared a love for the person that you all recently lost. Um, and I think that's an important factor that can get lost in talking about money or stuff. Um, and just want to encourage people to help try and preserve a relationship that you might have with people who um, may not have been in a relationship with you for an other reason that the, the person who just passed away is the connector. So um, there's still a, a lot of reasons to maintain those relationships. They may look different, um, but um, I think it's important to keep going. Um, Estate plans. Um, that's an interesting term sometimes. Um, some people are big planners and plan ahead and have a lot of details worked out. Um, some people don't seem to realize that they might pass away at some point and um, need to have something worked out. Um, we've those of us um, that work in this field work with both kinds. Um, but what I believe is that the blended family is in a, a particularly difficult um, situation to think about when it comes to estate planning. And there's many things in that relationship that don't often get thought of um, in estate planning. Um, being that this is my job, um, this is a conversation that I've had with my wife. Um, and I'm good at talking about tough topics. I've been a therapist, I've been a mediator. I don't have a problem with getting into conflict situations. Um, that being said, I was not really excited and I was having a hard time actually having this type of conversation with my wife. Um, in particular, um, it has to do with talking about what her relationship would look like with my daughters after I'm gone. And that's uncomfortable. Um, and so I think many people avoid that conversation because it's so uncomfortable. Um, but the reality of it is something were to happen to me, um, sometime in the near future, um, the, the, the lives of my daughters and my wife, who is not their mother, um, are likely going to go in different directions. Um, and so my conversation with my wife had to do with saying, I want them to have certain things that I feel are their right to have at the time of my passing. Um, in a non-blended situation, you don't think much about that. Oftentimes it's the parent of the kid who gets the bulk of the assets at that time and then the kids don't get it until the other parent passes away. And we just don't think about that. 
And I think it needs to be a little different in blended family. Um, another little story, another little joke, um, a couple uh, going through their planning of their will. And as they're working together, they're talking about what to do with this and what to do with that. He looks at his wife and says, you know, if something were to happen to me, I want you to know that I want you to be happy in life. And if that means that you're going to remarry someday, um, I want you to know I'm okay with that. But the one thing that I would like is to make sure that your new husband doesn't get my golf clubs. And his wife says, oh, you don't have to worry about that. He's not left-handed. So, um, hopefully we're not talking about those situations in our estate planning, but um, a reality of what my conversation with my wife was is if someday you plan on later involving my kids in some estate plans, um, that could change when your relationship status changes in the future. And she got to a point where she said, okay, I get it. I understand that. And um, so then it was a, a situation of, yeah, okay, it makes sense for these things in this situation to happen in a different way than in a non-blended family. Um, so um, where does that leave us? Um, I think obviously in in the context of what we're talking about right now we're not talking about planning for a future event we're talking about things that often times we're sitting in a situation where uh, a spouse has passed away and we are facing and sitting across the table uh, with uh, the children that are not my children and um, there's some tension in the air um, so I have a few pieces of little advice um, when you find yourself in that situation and maybe the estate plan, the beneficiary designations, um, whether they exist or not, um, or a will that may have not been detailed enough to um, address these complicated issues um, needs to now be um, dealt with. Um, my first piece of advice is to get good legal advice um, before you start having conversations with the kids. Um, know from your what legally belongs to whom before people start claiming things. Um, and get a good understanding of the gray areas. Um, I think that's that's core. Um, oftentimes, you know, in mediation, I found that people before they sat down with me to mediate their situation, they had already spent hours fighting with each other over something um, that they didn't need to even fight over. Because when we came in, we sat down. I'd say, "But this is what the law says," and they'd go, "Oh." Um, so I think much of that can be avoided by simply just getting a good understanding of um, what's already been decided um, legally. Um, I think one of the, the next important things is recognizing things that have sentimental value. Um, and here's where we're, we're maybe getting away from money, but that doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't also have monetary value. Um, this can range from jewelry to furniture to real estate. Um, and starting to put some thought into that sentimental value. Um, oftentimes, um, in a mediation situation, I found that people's motivation for why they wanted something was different. And if somebody's motivation was because it's got monetary value and somebody else had a had an interest in it because of a sentimental value, um, you're not coming to the table with the same 
interest and it can't be resolved without looking at it that way. So um, one of the things that I think can often soften um, that uh, tension about these situations is offering those things that have special sentimental value to the kids um, with a gesture that says, I know how special this is to you and I want you to have it. Um, and maybe that means that in exchange, you're looking for something else. But um, being able to present it in such a way that you're acknowledging that I know how valuable this is. Um, it, can, it, it doesn't necessarily even have to be something that has financial value. Um, my aunt um, took some mason jars when my grandparents passed, were both passed away and the, there was a need to go through the house that they lived in for 50 years. Um, and, you know, part of it was going into a dumpster, part of it was going into a Goodwill bin, and uh, the rest of it, we we're trying to figure out who wanted what. Um, but my aunt took mason jars and went through the house and was finding things that she knew would remind us all of our grandparents. And she put together these little jars for each of us grandkids with stuff that we all could just look at that jar and go, oh yeah, and these are things that we grew up around that house with. Um, and uh, it was just such a meaningful gesture um, that it just, uh, I think when I, when I think about that in a situation where there's some tension between family members, I think things like that can really go a long way um, in helping people work out those differences. Um, spending some time reflecting, um, and in particular, I think finding somebody who is a third party, who's not going to get anything, a, a good friend um, or a trusted person that knew your spouse well, somebody you can consult with and sit down and get a sense of what the, you would believe that your spouse would want for their children who are not your children. Um, and I think sometimes it's important that we, we find that outside person, we find that person who's not um, motivated one way or another in the situation to help give us, and, and not, the, not the legal counsel or the financial advisor like me, um, but somebody who knows the situation and knows the person and can say, you know what, I really believe that this is probably what they would we would want would want to have happen, and they realize maybe you don't want to hear that. Um, but uh, I think that's an important distinction as well. Um, finally, I think um, it's important to recognize that, and and I found this in mediation process is that um, it's very easy when it comes to things that people are are fighting over. Um, to create um, a process that becomes stressful, expensive, um, long drawn out, and in the end is not worth what you got. Um, as a mediator, I always found that if we could get people to start with um, a sense of what am I willing to give in order to get something else, but starting with the give, um, things wrap up quickly and in a way that people are much more happy with. Um, there's an old saying in the world of mediations and negotiations um, that says the art of negotiation is giving the other person what you want. And it doesn't mean you're giving them the thing you want. It means that you're giving them the uh, arrangement that you want. 
that the arrangement that you want is being presented in a way that's attractive to the other person. Um, and I think that's an important distinction here too. Um, there's value in reaching an agreement that people are happy with that didn't take a judge making a decision on. Um, so I think that's uh, a critical piece of the, the puzzle too. Um, finally, you know, uh, this kind of was woven through there, I think a little bit, but don't go it alone. Um, friends, family, um, work colleagues, people that are around you, make sure that you are um, surrounding yourself with support as you're going through this, especially if there's tension among the family. Um, wings for widows. Um, I've been a part of this organization for the better part of a year, but still less than a year, and just have really appreciated uh, Chris and Leanne and um, just so many of the people who um, have put this together and allowed it to be a place where um, I can just watch so many people get blessed by um, something that I can't believe has been missing for so long, to be honest. Uh, so um, the resources and the amount of time that's been put into creating this organization um, definitely encourage everybody to use it. Um, and um, to that end, um, if people have a blended family situation and want to have a more one-on-one -on -one conversation about it, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, you can contact Wings for Widows, um, Leanne or uh, Carrie, uh, I believe, and they will put happy to schedule um, a phone call or a Zoom call with anybody who is struggling with a blended family um, estate situation. So, um, Leanne, that's all I have. Um, and I think we're right to, oh, just a couple of minutes after eight. So I was going to try and keep it under. But, uh, That's fine. That was really helpful information. And I've worked with some, I've worked with some, as you know, we've worked with several uh, widows who are struggling with that very situation and with yeah. just uncomfortable family situations. And it, it, in a way, it's so tragic that sometimes the spouse's family, right at the time when you need the support of, of your whole family, your in-laws as well as your own family, and somehow there's a rift. And people react to grief in a way that is sometimes hard to understand. They're uncomfortable being around you because you've experienced that loss and they don't quite know what to say. And so yeah. it, we all go through that and it's, it is, it's very hard to bear when you feel like you've been abandoned by your family or worse, that they've become your enemies. Yeah. So, yeah. So we, that's why, we're, why we exist. We didn't, I guess before I was a widow, I didn't understand that there were all these circumstances that are so um, just devastating beyond the death there are all these implications that unfold and and that we all are going through those things so i just want to kind of again say we're here to help you to walk through with expertise and understanding and if you or anyone you know is in that circumstance we we're really here to help you and it doesn't cost anything <laughs> I'm gonna give you a little commercial for um, our next Zoom call, which is um, July 29th. And if you were in, uh, in the Zoom call a couple, three, well, it's about a month ago now, Steve Zare, who um, is a local minister, he's a worship minister at a Presbyterian church, and he cared for his wife for 30 years through a very difficult um, mental illness. And um, he is going to, 
he wasn't able to come on the call uh, when he was scheduled a month ago, but he's been rescheduled for this next time, the 29th. And he's going to be talking about kind of finding your identity after being a long caregiver. And I know many of you have cared for your spouse as he was dying. And uh, Steve will have some interesting insights and one of the rare men that will be speaking <laughs> to us. Um, he has uh, grown up daughters, but he raised his daughters through that time. Um, so it's, I think it's an incredible story you'll want to tune in. And then in addition, our financial topic will be Mark Gassner, who is Wings for Widows CPA. So he's a, a tax guy. And he's going to talk up about some of the laws that affect widows specifically um, in regards to your taxes. So I think it's going to be a really pertinent topic. They should have had that today with filing tax day today. So. Yeah, well, that's why he couldn't <laughs> talk today because he's big. <laughs> yes. So thank you very much, Jeff and Susie. You just did a great job. I know everyone learned a lot. And uh, this um, call will be recorded. It has been recorded. And uh, Chris will edit it and then put it on our YouTube channel. So in a few days, should be able to tune in and listen to it again. Thank you very much for everyone attending and I hope I see you again. Have a good evening. Enjoy this lovely evening. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.